We are up and going whenever you are ready, Secretary. Wonderful, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Secretary Dawn Krim. I serve as the chair of the Governor's Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council. I'm excited to welcome everyone to meeting number three of the council. And so as I think about all the good work that has happened so far, I'm glad you all are tuning in to participate as council members and community members and guests to get this update of the third meeting of the Governor's Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council. First, I'd like to start with our roll call. I will actually call the name of the members. If you are present, please unmute yourself and say present, and then I will check to ensure that we have quorum. I'll first begin with Robin Davis. Present. Kevin Carr. Present. Reverend Dr. Monica Cummings. I believe she will be a little late, so please be ready to let her in the room when she arrives. Vashika Kidd. Present. Vanessa McDowell. Present. Adeen Palau. Present. Marie Summers. Present. Secretary Karen Timberlake. Mai J. Loli. Present. Thank you. Dr. LeVar Charleston. Present. Secretary Emily Amason. Present. Victor Barnett. Jessica Bowling. Present. Percy Brown Present. Jr. Uh, uh, but go back. Is that Victor? Victor is present. Great. Thank you, Victor. Uh, uh, Percy Brown Jr. Present. QL Amin. Present. Thank you. Ruben Hopkins. Secretary Amy Pachakit. Present. Thank you. Marquesa Tucker. Beth Robolowski. Present. Thank you. Secretary Mary Kolar. Present. Thank you. Jessica Cavasos. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Nizreen Ada. Present. Thank you. Reverend Dr. Alex G. Present. Thank you. Tammy Rivera. Shondell Spivey. Greg Steinberger. Present. Thank you. Dr. Ottawa, L.A. White. Odawa, sorry. Odawa. Present. Yep. Uh, my song. Present. And Secretary Carr, I do apologize. I should have addressed you as secretary initially. My apologies. Larice, do we have quorum? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to also open up with a few announcements. Please remember to mute your phone or Zoom when you're not speaking. If you do have a question, please raise your hand to be acknowledged. Also, there has been quite a bit of activity by this council since we've last met. And I like to often uh, hear about things that people are doing and publicly recognize those that are doing uh, these good works. So a big congratulations goes out to Shondell Spivey. He is now the executive director for Black Leaders Acquiring Collective Knowledge, Black. Uh, also a big, a big congratulations goes out to Secretary Kolar. She has been recognized for a leadership award from Heroes for Healthcare. Way to go, Secretary Kolar. Also, we've just recently had uh, Madison 365 had their leadership summit, and there were two nominations from the uh, people who serve on the advisory council. So a big congratulations first to Robin Davis for her nomination for the social justice leader of the year. 
And then I'd like to follow up with a big congratulations to Vanessa McDowell for being the selected winner for Social Justice Leader of the Year, in which I'm just proud that both our members of this council have been doing incredible work in their communities and being recognized by the media, thusly recognized by us. Also, a big congratulations goes out to uh, Secretary Joel Brennan. He actually is now a member of uh, the committee as the lar at-large director of the executive committee for the National Association of State Administrators. And then Dr. LeVar Charleston actually had his first UW-Madison Diversity Forum, a two-day part virtual, part in-person forum last week in which uh, this council, myself, Malika Ivanko and Secretary Brennan had a chance to present at a session. Uh, it was a wonderful forum. If people attended, please be sure to fill out your survey. And Dr. Charleston, congratulations to you for moderating the panel of experts on the importance of securing voting rights on podcasts, your vote. And then we have one last congratulations that is sad to me, but should be happy for us all. But our very own executive director from WIDA, uh, Joaquin Atoro, has been uh, appointed, has a presidential appointment from President Joe Biden as an administrator for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Housing Services. So a big congratulations to uh, Joaquin for that nomination because of the 30 years of great work he's done in the state of Wisconsin. Many of you that attended the uh, statewide diversity awards would have had an opportunity to hear about some of the uh, his life experiences and the impacts he's made in housing. So no surprise to many of us that he would be tapped by President Joe Biden to go work in his administration, but I must say, he will be sorely missed. But a big congratulations to all of you on the council who have been recognized this morning for all the good work you do. And everyone else that has not been highlighted today, we know you are doing impactful work that makes a difference. So I, I wanted to start there. Next, I wanna go ahead and review the meeting agenda and approve our August minutes. Just as a quick reminder, we will follow Robert rules of order. And so we will have motions and actions that we will vote on to move forward to uh, the next part of the agenda. But for today, you all should have received six documents for this meeting. That would have included, of course, the agenda, the meeting minutes, a uh, student diversity internship brochure, breakout session guidance, and work plan guidelines. And so now I will accept a motion to approve today's agenda. So move, Jessica Cavazos. Thank second. you. Is there a second? Second. Aye. Great. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you all. We will move forward with the agenda. First up, uh, before I do that, I do need a motion to approve the August minutes. If I have someone uh, wish to uh, move to approve those minutes. So move, Marie Summers. Great, thank you, Marie. Is there a second? This is my, my lowly second. Great, thank you so much. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. The minutes have been approved. Now I'd like to move on to this morning's agenda. We will first open up with remarks from Governor Tony Evers. As shared, I am pleased and proud to have a governor that keeps diversity, inclusion, and equity work at the forefront. And this council is his council, and it's one that he is very supportive of and appreciates the work that we do, so much so that he comes by at every council meeting to provide a bit of update for us and to listen in to the good work we're doing. So with that, I will now hand the mic over to Governor Tony Evers. Thanks, Dr. Krim. And uh, can you hear me all right? 
I'm, I'm just doing this uh, orally right now. Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Um, so I was asked, oh, good morning, everybody. And I was asked to uh, provide some updates on a few grant programs we, we've announced since last meeting. Uh, and last month, I announced uh, the launch of a previously announced grant program and two grant programs. And so I'll just start out with small businesses. Clearly, they are the lifeblood of any community, but you know, it's, it's no secret that the pandemic has disproportionately impacted many communities, whether we're talking health or uh, economic. Some, some businesses were hit especially hard and haven't been able to recover at the same pace as others. Obviously, this, this is especially true uh, of our communities of color and diverse businesses and those historically underserved and underinvested communities. That's why I was pleased to announce three programs we we're able to make uh, large investments in. And the, the first one is the Equitable Recovery Grant Program, and that's a $50 million uh, allocation. And this, this program was announced earlier this year. We opened up the application period, however, for this program last month. The purpose of this grant is to assist community-based organizations that provide services or programming related to increasing equity or eliminating dispar disparities in health, early childhood, education, economic support, housing, environmental justice, uh, providing those to um, Wisconsin residents and qualified census tracts are disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Applications uh, will be uh, uh, kind of looked at and evaluated in two separate award allocations, $25 million for health, early childhood and education, and $25 million for economic support, housing, environmental justice. So grants will be provided uh, up to $1 million uh, per eligible nonprofit. And today is the last day for folks to apply. Second one, is a diverse business assistance grant program and that's 37 and a half million dollars uh, that will support chambers of commerce and other economic development nonprofits that serve businesses from communities historically designed excuse me denied access to capital and communities that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic eligible organizations uh, include nonprofits uh, non-governmental chambers, uh, tribal chambers of commerce, and other nonprofit organizations that provide technical assistance to small businesses in and providing services and qualified census tract to business-owned uh, individuals uh, that were historically denied access to capital in other, in other communities that uh, were disproportionately impacted by the uh, pandemic. The DOA will be launching applications for that very soon. Uh, another piece of that is another $37.5 million uh, project uh, dealing with the Diverse Business Investment Grant Program that will provide uh, the amount of money I just mentioned to community development financial institutions, CDFIs, to provide grants to small businesses and micro businesses with 10 or fewer employees um, owned by uh, individuals disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and and the same group as before, businesses that have historically been underbanked, historically lacked access to capital, and uh, and and, to, and the uh, CDFIs are also eligible for that. So DOA will be launching those applications very soon. So that gives you an update on that. Uh, overall, I, I feel uh, that we're getting the uh, resources from the federal government to the right places. Uh, at the right time. Uh, clearly, we're, we are not out of the woods yet with this pandemic. So uh, we, we, we believe that this, um, uh, th these, these grants will be very helpful uh, as, as, uh, as businesses try to reopen and, uh, and, and frankly, uh, thrive going forward. So, uh, Dr. Krim, that is my report for the day. Obviously, I also thank all the members who are on today and, and those that aren't, uh, this is really important work and uh, you've done a great job, Dawn, in organizing this uh, this group and looking forward to uh, 
uh, hearing uh, hearing some more uh, yet this morning. So thanks so much for all the good work. Great. Well, we do appreciate your um, updates. I want to open it up now to council members for questions that they may have. Just want to remind you to please raise your hand so we can call on you uh, with your question for Governor Evers. Questions? Uh, Jessica Cavazos. Uh, this is just a remark and I want to thank you all. Uh, Governor, thank you so much for believing in our minority chambers. It is a very um, momentous and it's a landmark um, movement on, on your behalf. I just want to recommend that you promote it. I, I was talking to other chambers around different states and they did say that this is nothing that they've ever heard. So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to, to actually promote that uh, Wisconsin is doing something that is really long-term impacting um, communities of color. And, and this is something that we should uh, really celebrate. So thank you so much for your support. Yeah, thank, thanks for that comment. Uh, I, I didn't know that, uh, that this was a, a unique thing. Uh, to me, it was just an issue that made uh, extraordinarily good common sense. And, and so thanks, thanks for the comment and we'll, we'll continue to get the word out. Great, we have a question from Mai Loli. Thank you, um, this is Mai Loli and I was running with a grant application that was due today. Do you know when the applicants would hear there was a timeline issue or some misunderstanding on that? That's a great question. Is uh, anybody from the DOA on, I know the deadline, I, I'm just not sure. Just, just my experience, uh, it has been that uh, on different projects it takes it takes a good couple of weeks to uh, figure out who is uh, first, who is eligible, and then to uh, you know to to make those decisions. But um, I don't know if Joel is on or anybody I else. I am, Governor. Away. Yeah. Okay. I, I am on, and um, I, I think that you've outlined. Um, I, I hope people can appreciate and understand. Many of the same people are doing the administering of all of these grants. And so we're trying to do them in as thoughtful and methodical a way as possible. There was um, a, a deadline yesterday for large capital projects around the state that local units of government could do. Today is the deadline for the equitable recovery program. It, I think what we have officially said is that we're looking at between now and likely the end of the year or right at the beginning of 2022 to be able to get these dollars out the door. As the governor has said, the priority is to make sure we're getting these out as efficiently as we possibly can. We wanna make sure in a number of these cases, um, it, not surprisingly, the, the programs are oversubscribed. There are you know, more qualified applicants than we have dollars, even though we've tried to maximize the amount of dollars available. So we wanna make sure we're, we're spending as much time as we can, but doing it in a real efficient manner. Um, so we're looking at, again, towards the end of the year or uh, the beginning of 2022 in order to get these dollars out. Thank you very much. Great. Other questions people may have? So I'll jump in quickly, Joel. I, I believe when some of the programs were initially introduced, uh, WEDC has uh, raised their hand to assist with grant writing for some of the applicants that may um, have questions or concerns. There may be additional resources. Is that accurate? And uh, if you could speak to any assistance maybe grantees might need in responding to uh, this opportunity. Sure, in, in most of these occasions, on, on most of the grants, um, there have been webinars that have been run either through DOA or in partnership with others, uh, with other agencies. I know WEDC and some of the some of their regional aspects have provided support um, as people were doing the application. I think one of the things we have tried to do is make the applications as easy as possible to do, uh, so that it's not an onerous process. We're trying to make sure that we are um, getting these into the hands of people and that they are not spending, having to spend a whole bunch of time or money to do these application responses. So, you know, there's a premium put on the efficiency. There are also webinars. And, and when these webinars have been done, they're also uh, put online. There are emails that people can sign up to uh, just ensure that they continue to get information. 
There are question and answers uh, for a number of these programs. We have gotten uh, questions that have been submitted and then the responses are then shared with everybody who has a potential responded to it as well. So, so wherever possible, and, and this is all done for the, for the most part through the DOA website um, and through the emails that have been sent out, we've tried to share information for all of the potential applicants wherever possible. Great, thank you. So I see we have three questions queued up. I'm gonna first go to Ruben Hopkins, then Percy Brown Jr., then Mai Zong. Ruben. Um, uh, and thank you for taking I don't really have a question. I just wanna say that uh, the uh, bounce back grant, the Main Street bounce back grant, um, the, has been really popular and I has not stopped ringing. As a matter of fact, I have it turned down right now because uh, I know that um, we're getting calls about it. And so businesses need the help and they appreciate it. And, um, and I appreciate it uh, because it's, uh, it's not only gotten my current members to, you know, get active, but it's also uh, driven new members to the chamber. And I, uh, and we all appreciate the, um, we just know, just know we all appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ruben. Percy Brown Jr. Good morning, Governor Evers. Uh, first, let me thank you so much uh, for your leadership for the great state of Wisconsin. Uh, my question is unrelated to your report, but more specific to uh, the bill that was passed in the state assembly that could tremendously impact public education in regard to what teachers can teach around race, gender, the professional development uh, that needs to be offered to educators, but also state, county, and city employees. Uh, I do quite a bit of consulting and, and I'm working with school districts across the state, but I, I'm really noticing that there uh, is, is strong organization around this push or this anti-critical race theory push, which is aligned to this bill. So I just wanted to, uh, ask if you have any commentary on that, but I also wanted to just bring it into the space to make everyone uh, here aware of what's at play and, and what the implications can be uh, for the state moving forward. Yeah, and, and thanks for bringing that up, Percy. Uh, I, I haven't seen the, 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 the bill itself. I, I, certainly, I certainly understand the, uh, I, don't, I don't support it, but I understand the, the general gist of it. And the idea of uh, essentially squelching learning and teaching as it relates to, you know, our history, our present, and our future, as, and as it relates to uh, uh, what, what the opponents of this are talking about is critical race theory. Uh, it's frightening. I mean, there's 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 no way, no other way to put it. The the idea that we're going to um, essentially gag uh, teachers or or gag school boards or gag university officials uh, and not allow them to speak the truth is frightening. So I hope that gives you some idea where I'm headed with this. I usually don't uh, comment on, on bills that I haven't seen yet, which I haven't seen yet. But uh, believe me uh, that uh, the, the, you know, essentially putting a gag order on uh, telling the truth, that's a problem for our democracy. And, uh, and we just have to be, you know, so that gives you an idea where I'm going to land on this. But uh, we also have to be, as a group, as, as a nation, as a state, um, rise up and uh, uh, continue to fight this, uh, regardless of the of this particular bill. I mean, clearly, it's it's going to be an issue uh, on numerous uh, uh, races, uh, political races in the future, and uh, uh, and so thanks for bringing it up. It's it's something that's very concerning, and uh, I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you, Governor. Thanks. Bye, Saul. Thank you, Secretary Krim. Hello, Governor Evers. Um, Hello. The mask looked great on you, by the way. <laughs> 
Um, I want to take a moment. I know we, I think most of us have seen a couple of weeks ago that you had um, announced the $2 million to support mental health in uh, Southeast Asian and minority communities. I want to take a moment to say thank you to that and thank you, Joel, for your department and their support. Um, for the, I know we had a few folks that had asked about the grant that was um, due, is due today. And Joel, maybe we could take it offline just to ask a couple of questions, but I know there's uh, the capacity piece of certain minority organizations that couldn't get access to some of those Q and A's. So I'd love to talk about that at a certain time. Please feel free to reach out directly, even today, if you want to, and we can have that conversation even at a break or uh, as soon as the meeting is done today. Wondering if there are other questions. I know we often don't get the opportunity to have a direct dialogue with the governor. So with the amount of millions of dollars that have been allocated to communities, businesses, and particularly thinking about and being mindful and intentional uh, with communities of color, faith communities, et cetera, it's important that we continue to amplify what's available and help our members, our colleagues, our community uh, access these dollars. Wondering if there are other questions. We're great on time, so I wanted to just uh, give people the opportunity if they have questions. All right. Well, I appreciate uh, Governor Evers, you providing that update, as well as Joel uh, stepping in with some of the responses. And we are now going to move to our subcommittee reports, and uh, everyone will be listening in. So uh, take it away. We'll first start with our community engagement subcommittee. That subcommittee lead is Secretary Mary Kolar. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Secretary Krim, for this opportunity. Uh, our subcommittee met on October 20th, and we started our meeting with members briefly describing how they were doing. And also everyone shared uh, recent cultural events and services that they had been involved, when, involved with in their communities and throughout the state. We then reviewed action responses from previous meetings all agreed that the subcommittee should focus on outreach to diverse and minority organizations throughout Wisconsin, most frequently mentioned as a possible site for sharing announcements of cultural events was Travel Wisconsin, which is created by the Wisconsin Department of Tourism. The tourism website and electronic newsletters may be a good format for informing citizens of cultural events in Wisconsin and the region. So once members had agreed to focus on diverse and minority organizations, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. <clears throat> we uh, responded and discussed the following questions. So number one was how do we need to develop relationships with uh, various communities and inside those communities? In addition to the Department of Tourism, other entities recommended were chambers of commerce, community foundations, public libraries, higher ed, including universities and colleges, et cetera, tribal organizations, city and county equity councils, as well as service organizations such as Rotary Clubs. We next asked, how should we structure this multi-directional communication for maximum impact? Before trying to go statewide, we agreed that the effort should start small to build trust within a community and learn from potential mistakes. Thirdly, what will be the basis of our decisions? For example, choosing collaborative partners, determining levels of engagement, enhancing communication, we recognize that we need to be conscious of the needs of the community where we may pilot our activities. Resources may be limited, but uh, we may not be aware of 
non-visible populations. We discussed how we choose who we pilot with and the need to know from the starting point what that should be. And also we look to have a quick win to make continuation of our proposal more likely. Fourth, what are the outcomes we seek to achieve? Why are they important? We want to create an environment that recognizes diversity, creates more understanding and more appreciation for one another. And the result is also good for recruiting people to live and work in Wisconsin. Our next meeting is currently scheduled for January 26 at 2 p.m. And I just ask all members to be prepared as we begin our action plan, we may need to schedule a meeting before that as well. That's my report. Thank you, Secretary Grimm. Great, thank you very much, Secretary uh, Kolar. We will now move to our subcommittee update, the Economic and Business Development Subcommittee. Dr. Charleston. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for, for your leadership. Uh, the Economic and Business Development Subcommittee um, uh, last met on October 12th. And, and so as we were thinking ahead uh, about our work plans, which we will discuss today. We were really thinking about the opportunities to think about and engage in points of uh, synergy and best practices and or areas of opportunity as it relates to many current or upcoming initiatives that the government is con uh, currently endeavoring. Um, prior to digging into that, we've had uh, some administrative changes in our committee. And so uh, uh, particularly grateful for the entire committee's willingness to step up to ensure that our administrative needs are met um, so that we can move forward uh, collectively uh, without any interruptions. So we're all set in that regard. We have the great fortune of having uh, Secretary uh, Pachasik um, to, to, to in, inform us or update us about the, uh, the workforce development grants and opportunities. And so we uh, sort of got an insider look about those uh, opportunities and and thinking about the uh, across the three where they're uh, even as we're sort of um, communicating to folks these opportunities as uh, sort of Secretary Brennan was talking about a little bit earlier we were thinking about educating and reaching the populations we're attempting to to serve even around our sort of goal of educating targeted populations within the state around procurement and contracting processes so those communication processes is something that we were really trying to pay attention to and see if we can learn from or see if there's areas of opportunity as we uh, uh, begin to sort of pursue our work um, and so thinking about those sort of boots on the grounds and sort of the business development opportunities, the workforce boards that we may be in contact with, um, we are, uh, uh, we have sort of finalized a questionnaire that we want to send out to the chambers, uh, the multicultural chambers to really sort of get a sense of uh, any barriers, any uh, best practices or big ideas that could inform our work and sort of thinking about other um, highly technological or non-technological spaces to communicate and thinking about the stakeholders uh, to communicate that, that communicates their own reach. Um, and so uh, we know that there are sort of many pathways and, and distribution lists, but we're trying to figure out how to achieve the greatest impact. And so uh, that's what I meant by us sort of looking at what's happening here and, 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 and seeing where we could sort of chime in and add value. We know that the pathways still need a little bit more work. And so what is it that this group can do with our goals of sort of uh, identifying trainings and policies and measures that undergird or inform our strategies to increase the utilization of, of minority and women owned businesses. And so um, we also uh, are looking at other opportunities. Uh, there is, uh, we have a connection with the supplier diversity program at University of Wisconsin Madison. We know that that can inform our work, and that part of those contracting and procurement uh, opportunities are happening right there on campus. And and so we were uh, exploring that opportunity and building those connections, and have a couple of meetings that are coming up uh, with some key folks to think about how that can inform our work in the uh, in the um, in economic and business development space. Uh, another thing that's coming up that we're thinking about uh, around future impact and in possibly current impact is the, the marketplace that's going to be on December 7th through the 9th and um, thinking about what opportunities we have uh, to make an impact there. Could we be asking some pertinent questions or, you know, workshopping a list of recommendations that can inform our work in those spaces uh, as well. So, um, you know, uh, and, and then we're, we're uh, also wrestling with uh, you know, what we know about, you know, even fraudulent practices and diversity related uh, contracts and sort of how to uh, ameliorate 
uh, those to enhance opportunities for our targeted populations. And, and, and lastly, really thinking about um, expanding, and this is an ongoing conversation, I think we probably talk about this in every meeting, about organizations or entities that are already helping uh, a minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses navigate um, doing business with the state and or local government and how we can capitalize on opportunities or expand those opportunities uh, for ourselves. So I, I'll stop there. It, between you, what you've reported so far, and what Secretary Kolar has reported, your subcommittees are quite active, thinking big picture, but looking at what can you specifically impact through these action plans. So I appreciate all of the due diligence that uh, your subcommittee and the community engagement subcommittee has uh, been undertaking under both of your leadership. That takes us to data and policy. Robin Davis, please provide your update. Yes, thank you, Secretary Krim. And um, on behalf of our subcommittee, I offer this update. So by way of reminder, our charge is to review um, data policies, statutes, and regulations to eliminate barriers and gaps and inequities in home ownership, business development, and employment. Um, we've met twice since the last council meeting um, in September and October. And in our September, well, probably earlier meeting, we made a decision as a subcommittee that we would focus on employment first, as it is the springboard to home ownership and business development. Um, and at the same time, we began having some of those conversations about what would success look like for our subcommittee. In our September meeting, um, thanks to uh, the support of DOA and um, Larice, we began to review and discuss some data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics around, civil, around the civil labor force, um, as well as the state of Wisconsin employment data. Um, thanks to our subcommittee member, Adine Palau, he prepared a PowerPoint presentation to help us um, kind of grasp the breadth of that data and begin to get some understanding of uh, where we could go. We had some really uh, robust discussion around not only uh, the data that was presented, but also what is the data that is not being shared that will inform um, our work going forward and why isn't it being shared? Some other comments made by uh, subcommittee members was, uh, the importance of real-time and transparent data, the implications of COVID and how that impacts livable wages, the benefit, benefit cliffs issues that many um, are experiencing, how that impacts the promotions. One of our subcommittee members talked about a round table that she had been a part of, of women talking about what happens when promotions are offered and how that impacts um, their journey in terms of financial well-being. We also talked about the safety concerns of public facing jobs. Uh, then in October's meeting, we continued the review of that uh, census data and also talked about the fact that we were going to be receiving guidance and templates for our upcoming work plans. And then to begin thinking about once again, how do we define success? What will our performance metrics be? Um, and then we also took a look at the state of Wisconsin classified workforce and affirmative action report. Once again, um, that led to some very robust discussion. Uh, some of the highlights were the underrepresentation of persons of color in many of the categories, uh, the concentration of ethnic minorities in certain classifications. Um, and then of course the related question and why is that? Um, the uh, significant drop in employment amongst Native and Alaskan Indians. We also took a look at um, DHS's and DOC's equity and inclusion plans. Uh, we talked about uh, aligning the language. So, uh, you know, the state still uses the term affirmative action, whereas private employers are using DEI. So how we, we may need to align that language. And then um, what we should be looking at in terms of the actual execution and implementation of practices, right? So hiring, retention, promotion, what do, what do those actual practices look like and how do they impact um, not only the experience of state workers, but also private employers as well? Um, what kind of strategies will we need to employ as a state as we look at data? Um, and how is the state perceived as an employer? 
um, as well. And then uh, there was an additional question that has arisen in our past meetings around what is the what is the role of the state if there is one in investigating and em enforcing employment discrimination complaints. And when you're looking at not only within the state, but certainly private employers and what happens with those that um, are consistently found to be in violation of state statutes and how that in impacts um, hiring and retention. So uh, given the breadth of our committee charge, we did decide uh, at our last meeting that we would extend our meetings from one hour to one and a half hours. And we do have um, an upcoming meeting scheduled for January 20th. We may need to talk about um, adjusting our schedule maybe for earlier in January so that we will be in alignment on um, our work plan. And that is my report. Thank you, Secretary Cram. Wow, thank you for that detailed, robust report. You all are in public, private, definitions, categories. I appreciate all of the good work that is occurring in all three subcommittees. And uh, I'll give the governor just a moment to uh, weigh in quickly on what he has heard so far from these reports, any uh, reaction that he may have before we move to Lieutenant Governor Barnes' remarks. Governor Evers? Yeah, well, first of all, just uh, uh, a thank you to the, 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 the subcommittees that are, are doing this great work. Clearly, uh, it's complex, difficult work, and uh, you're your willingness to kind of go above and beyond. I know you all have other parts of your life that are important to you, and I and I don't necessarily want us all to uh, for, forget that. But the um, uh, the the real focus uh, for us uh, on making sure that um, uh, equity is at the heart of everything we do in state government, I think, it is such an important. Uh, important piece for us going forward. So, I, uh, you know, as far as commenting on the individual uh, updates, uh, they're all great. I really appreciate the good work and understand the, the um, you know, the, the timing, you know, the time, the time it takes for all of you to get this done uh, is, is just greatly appreciated. And so keep up the good work. I really appreciate it. Great, thank you, Governor Evers. And as I mentioned, we will be moving into the remarks from Lieutenant Governor Barnes, and he too has uh, been on and able to hear the reports and feedback and is excited about the work that he is doing that is aligned with the Governor's uh, Equity and Inclusion Council. So with that, I will turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Good morning. Hey. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Secretary Krim, and thank you, Governor Evers. I want to thank everybody else for being here. Also, uh, I'm like always excited when we get to do this work because it's more than just a, a promise. When we took office, this was just out of uh, pure necessity. And the people who are on this call today, the people who gave the reports, I mean, folks are going above and beyond. And the reality is you got to go above and beyond because we been down so low. And, you know, this is the first time in a long time, if ever, that this work is happening in such a uh, comprehensive way, uh, addressing all the social inequities uh, that we have that we're dealing with here in the state of Wisconsin. So I want to thank you, Secretary Cram, one more time for the introduction. I want to thank all the leaders for being here on the council today and for the work that you do when we're not meeting to make sure uh, that this state is a much better place for people that it has not been so great to historically. And we know that in order for us to fully realize the impact and the value of this work, we know that we have to have a sustainable impact on the advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we know that creating a lasting DEI impact or framework, this doesn't happen overnight. It takes a long time, but the problem is these issues, these issues have been ignored for as long as they've been ignored. And because of that, we are trying to rectify and correct generations of harm. And we know that this work needs to transcend whoever is in office. This is about more than the office holder. This is about us as a state. And how do we wanna be recognized? We wanna be recognized as a place that has been 
first at worst at some of the worst statistics and disparities? Or do we want to flourish and become a state that is attractive uh, to people, a place where people want to live and where people are able to live happy, healthy, productive, and safe lives? And now we know that we also have to engage in activities that go beyond the transition, excuse me, transactional uh, types that we've seen in the past. We know that we have to create foundations for true and lasting commitments from partners on all sides. And we know that when we're able to facilitate these discussions of people who are representing so many different backgrounds, so many different interests, that's when we get a much more broad scope. That's when we get a much more comprehensive uh, approach and then later on a much more lasting impact because of the work. And one thing we also need to do is to be sure that we consistently challenge ourselves. Uh, and it's important for us to also challenge the ordinary. And I always talk about the pandemic in terms of us not wanting to return to normal because normal just wasn't working for people. Normal wasn't enough. Too many people continued to be left behind. There were so many uh, disparities that existed before and there are disparities that will exist afterwards if we don't get serious. And this is obviously a serious group. Uh, this is obviously a serious gathering. And the people here understand this work, but there's still too many people who don't get it, who don't understand. And there are also those who are intentional objectors uh, to us moving our state in the right direction because they feel as if we uplift communities. They feel that if we establish equity in a state that has been inequitable, that that somehow will harm them or their interests or it may tap into uh, their quality of life. But we know that a rising tide lifts all boats. We know that when we create stable foundations for everybody in the state of Wisconsin and across this country, everybody does better. And there is no reason we should want to be in a place where folks are continuously left behind based on based on uh, based on race, based on sexual orientation, based on gender, ethnicity, religion, whatever the case may be. And that's why we need employees at every level, the state government to do their part to recognize, respect and represent the individuals from historically underrepresented and under-resourced communities. And as state government, the idea that some communities still are underrepresented or underserved or under-resourced should be something that does not sit well with any of us. It certainly does not sit well with me. I know it doesn't sit well with the governor and that's exactly why we're here today because we have to involve the stakeholders. We have to involve impacted communities in this conversation if we truly want to see the change that's gonna push us all forward. So I am uh, again, truly honored uh, to be here to participate in this work, to hear the stories, to hear the reports, to hear what's going on because we have a real shot at getting this right. We have a real shot to truly change the trajectory of Wisconsin. We have a shot, we have an opportunity to once and for all uh, make Wisconsin that place where people don't have to, you know, I'm sure all of you have friends from out of state, out of town, and every time a report comes out that shows some negative statistic in Wisconsin, they send it to you. Oh, did you know about that? It's like, oh, yeah, we knew about it. And this can be, uh, this can be the program, this can be the project, this can be the group of people that finally changes that. Uh, this can be the group of people that turns all that upside down on his head. And instead, in the next few years, we'll be seeing reports about how Wisconsin came up and defied all the odds and turned all those negative statistics into positives, turned everything that held us back into an opportunity. That's the Wisconsin I want to see. And I'm sure that's the Wisconsin people uh, here want to see as well. And I just want to thank you all for that work to help us get to that place because, you know, we have a long way to go, but I'll tell you, we have come so far and we are, uh, we are, we, we're, we're not close to out of the weeds yet, but we're so far from what we used to be. We're so far from the culture of state government that existed prior to uh, a, a, a culture that disregarded the realities of the lives of people in marginalized community and even marginalized situations uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, but again, just wanna thank you all for your work. I'm truly happy to be here and I wanna continue to help partner any way that I possibly can uh, to help see this work through, to help uh, make sure that this is a success and not just a short-term success either, not something that we just do to claim credit for, but something that will have a lasting foundational impact 
on Wisconsin, because I truly do also believe that we can set an example for other places across the country that deal with the same struggles as we do. Uh, we have been a leader in innovation in so many areas historically, and it is only because of our desire, the Wisconsin idea to meet the need, to meet the challenges that lie ahead of us. Uh, and I, this, is, this can certainly uh, be that moment where we meet the challenge in an unprecedented way. And I'm just incredibly grateful for the work of the people here today. Great, thank you very much for your remarks. And as you talk about leading, as uh, Jessica Cavazos pointed out, the grants and the federal funding support that has been allocated from this administration to our chambers of color is unprecedented and is leading statewide. We have a few moments. I'd like to open it up to council members who may have uh, questions of Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Uh, please raise your hand so we can call on you if you have a, we have time for a question or two. I always like to open it up if we have a moment or two for this opportunity for all council members. Ruben has his hand. Great, thank you, Ruben. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm double muted here, so give me one second. We can hear you. We can hear you. You can come, oh, here we go, here we go. Somehow, I'm double muted, so I gotta unmute. Okay, you hear me now? Yes. Yes, Hello? and then we'll yep. go to my okay. first Ruben. Sorry about that. Okay, okay um, I guess um, I know during our the report for uh, economic development, um, it was in about marketplace. Um, you know, I, I really, Marketplace is the governor's conference on minority business in this state. And I just think there's still so much missing uh, in Marketplace that can make it more attractive uh, for uh, around the state because the, the numbers related to the amount of spend that is going to minority businesses is never reported at Marketplace, even though it's a conference on minority business in the state. Is there any effort to change that? Thank you. And if uh, Lieutenant Barnes isn't aware, perhaps I think uh, Larissa's office helps and Joel, Secretary Brennan's office sets that up. So they may be able to assist with an answer there. Yeah, I, I can. I can. I can. Yeah, if I can remind people to mute when they're not speaking, and so what I will say to you, Ruben, is we will have someone follow up with you offline for some of those great ideas you have. But I will pause to see if uh, someone from the administration wants to jump in. I was waiting to hear if Secretary Brennan wanted to speak first. He, he may not. I can say that we will definitely take these ideas and move them to our um, office that works with disadvantaged businesses, um, our DBE office, um, and let them know what your um, concerns are, and then maybe even have more conversations about how these ideas can translate into um, um, more effective communication and um, getting this information out. So I have made a note of it and I will make sure that that information is um, shared, that question is shared and we'll get you some responses back. Great, thank you for that response and Ruben, thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. Faisal. Thank you, Secretary Cram. First of all, uh, thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, for all that you do uh, with ensuring that this is building the sustainability inclusion in our state, including our businesses. While we move forward, um, I know one, as the market 
place, we're talking about that too, and the continuation of the work from our committee and moving forward. Do you foresee, I know a lot of work has been going around minority businesses, but rural communities, uh, minority businesses in rural communities has been largely impacted and disproportionately impacted. But I know like given the, uh, given the track, census track, rural Wisconsin usually have smaller numbers, but that continues to eliminate these, these populations from getting resources. How do you foresee that we can work to making sure that that's a level playing field and we're actually getting resources to really helping these individuals over here too? That's a really good question. I think that's a good opportunity too for us to merge some of the rural prosperity work that's already happening with uh, with this work. I mean, there is a, you know, I, I wouldn't want to recreate the wheel. I think there's just an opportunity for some real synergy uh, between between the two. And I guess that's another perspective that isn't always considered. You know, people don't always think about minority businesses when they think about businesses in rural communities. So I thank you for bringing that up. Uh, but I guess, yeah, my biggest advice there would be to connect with the WEDC and their Rural Prosperity Initiative. Great. That, that's a great suggestion because sometimes when we think about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, we sometimes think a little narrowly in what has historically been defined. But when you think about urban versus rural, when you think about the makeup of the 72 counties, there are definitely some inequitable, uh, inequitable um, resource challenges. And uh, Lieutenant Governor Barr is mentioning that Rural Prosperity Report. Uh, I will be sure to reach out with uh, uh, Secretary Hughes to ensure that we are trying to cover a fully blanket uh, both areas. So thanks for that question, Bob. And thanks for that suggestion, uh, Lieutenant Governor Bards. Uh, time for one last question just before the break. All right. Well, seeing none, I want to, on behalf of the council, thank the governor and uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes for being with us this morning. Feel free to stay as long as your schedule allows. Uh, however, we appreciate both of your reports and your ability to field questions from the council and just for your commitment to this work and for recognizing and acknowledging the expertise and talents that are at this council and how they're doing incredible work in their communities. We appreciate this connection. And so with that, my clock says it is 9.57. We will have our 10 minute plus three minute that we gave break. Uh, so at 10, 10 a.m., we will reconvene. Please come back about 10.09 so that we can get started right at 10.10 with our remaining agency overviews and equity and inclusion updates. So I will see you all in 12 minutes.
So we are nearing our time to return. Hopefully most people have uh, returned from their break and we will resume with our council meeting momentarily. It's always nice when we actually can have that planned break. I still have flashbacks from our first council meeting where I didn't build a break into the sessions. So I'm glad at the midpoint we're able to do this. And so when we uh, return, we will move into our agency uh, updates. And uh, the this segment of our meeting will uh, be about kind of the tail end of the capacity building that I've been talking about since day one. This is meeting number three. You'll recall in the first, the second meeting, I talked about the great deal of capacity building. What I mean by that is uh, those on the council having an opportunity to learn more about state government and how state government operates by uh, hearing presentations, hearing updates from the various agencies and the uh, various offices and divisions and units of state government that might be able to provide, I'm sorry, this is our fourth meeting, that might be able to provide resources uh, that you can use as you're considering doing your work uh, on the subcommittees. So this is the, now the tail end of our agencies reporting out, which will, con which will conclude our formal capacity building portion of the council. So I uh, tried to quickly give you in two minutes or less uh, information about my agency at the last meeting in August. I have gained those minutes back, and so I will be providing an update about uh, the Wisconsin Department of Safety and Professional Services. After I speak, Anna Simpson will provide that overview and update for WIDA, the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority. And so now that we're all back, I will begin with my update from the Department of Safety and Professional Services. As we shared early on, all state agencies have created their equity and inclusion plan. And what I'm gonna provide for you today is the overview and highlights of the emphasis of the plan at this agency and how we are doing that work beyond simply the traditional rubric of equity, diversity, and inclusion. But first I wanna start by showing you a picture. I'm gonna bring it in close. This picture is my leadership team when I first started. This is the crew the group that started in the leadership roles, division administrators, as well as executive directors for this agency. And I share that to say, we started out and are still very much close to minority majority leadership. And that's done intentionally. When you think about some of the work of the subcommittees as they talked about how turnover happens at state agencies, how, where, who is in leadership, where are the women, where are the minorities, where are our veterans, our people with disabilities. When I was uh, high, appointed by Governor Evers in January 2019, that was forefront, at the forefront of my mind. And so I was very intentional with making sure that we had inclusive representation at the leadership level here at the agency. And I'm pleased to say we continue to do that and we impart that merit with all of our supervisors and other hiring authorities within our agency from the division administrator, the bureau chiefs, the section chiefs and supervisors, they know we walk the walk and talk the talk around equity, diversity, and inclusion. So recruitment, recruitment, recruitment was the top of mind strategic plan goals when we thought about this work. And those strategies was imparting those perspectives in the room, how we'll do better and richer work because we have those perspectives at the table. So recruitment has been an emphasis from day one and is the cornerstone of our equity and diversity and recruitment plan um, for our equity team here at the agency. 
retention. What we've learned is you make the hire, but then they may leave. You can't just have one or two and think your work is done. You have to build on what you've started and continue to create affinities, create flocking that I learned from the the UW Diversity Forum, ensuring that people see the value in a multicultural workplace, in a more inclusive workplace. So it's not just about recruitment, it's also about retention. But retention isn't just who walks in the door, it's how you treat people once they walk in the door. And when we talk about how you treat people, that means people need to be paid as adequately as possible. So we have looked at where are there opportunities for pay progression? Are there steps and stages within different positions so people can see their future, so people can be groomed for leadership in the future, but they have to see a pathway forward. Many of the positions that we had were flat. There was one step and then you had to interview to move to the next position. What we've done is we've created levels, the associate level, the team lead level, the senior level within several of the positions that we have in place. And that allows people to use that professional development, gain some leadership experience, and move up. We also retain our staff by shared leadership. We want your input. We want to hear feedback. When we're working on projects, the project leads are not just the division administrator. They are people within that unit that have the expertise and the desire to lead the project. So we are looking for those opportunities because we believe they are part of recruitment and retention. And if we do that, we will improve our agency culture because our agency culture has people knowing that they are valued and we embrace what they bring to the table so that we can do our best work together. We are 270 uh, employees out of five different offices. We have teams that cut across the different offices and different buildings, no matter your location. But it's about building a culture that knows they are valued and can have input. Next slide. So aside from those cornerstones of recruitment and retention within the work, what are we doing? How do we go beyond who we hire? How do we think about who we serve and the industries that we regulate in a more equitable way? How do we ensure that they too are benefiting from equity, diversity, and inclusion in the work that we deliver? One important way that we identified early on is when people are getting licensed, and we do over 1 million licenses every two years, but when people are obtaining their license, most times there's an exam. What we found is our trade exams were just in English. There is a wonderful community around the state that speaks Spanish, that it's their first language, so they can If you can help them in this exam be able to think in your first language, you're more apt to utilize all of that energy and expertise on answering the questions and how you first think about them, rather than translating it back to English, then from Spanish back to English to answering the question. So it gives you a more level playing field where you're thinking about the time it takes on those exams because you know they're timed. You can think and react in your native way. And so that's one big step that we've taken in our with our trade exams to help bolster uh, the construction industry and those in a workplace that we wish to hire around inspections and plan review. When you think about educational institution equity, people might not know we actually are the education approval program. It used to be the education approval board uh, several years ago, but they were reduced to a program. And what that means is we actually certify those for-profit institutions in the state of Wisconsin that are delivering instructions to barbers, cosmetologists, funeral directors, and others, trucking people that are going to those schools. We certify those schools. We also partner with 
online programming that happens in other states at other schools. Our education is, uh, institution equity is about ensuring that when people have a schooling idea and need certification, we're talking with them about what those plans look like and how they can reach out to all students in the state of Wisconsin, no matter their background or age or religion or uh, gender. And so also sometimes, unfortunately, for-profit schools and nonprofits have closed their doors without notice to students. When this happens, we actually hold on to a fund here to help those students be made whole with any resources they've lost and transfer their credits to other schools so they can continue their education. That's some of the work we do. In addition, all of those 200 and uh, 40 or so professions that we have, many of them are regulated by boards, committees, and councils. We have over 100 boards, committees, and councils. I have actually visited all those boards to say thank you to those who are volunteering to serve on those boards because they are putting out what are the qualifications needed for licensure in those areas. And so what I've asked is for them to be uh, inclusive about what's needed, but also bring the perspectives in the room that may be missing. So when we look at the makeup of those committees, we want to be sure that there's proper representation, including rural and urban, including location, because those license holders are in all 72 counties. So if we can, we want that type of representation in the boardroom, making decisions about what the requirements and standards are in those professions. And unfortunately, when there is wrongdoing or a complaint, we want to be sure those perspectives are brought to bear when we are adjudicating what those issues may be. When you think about uh, building codes, more sustainable building codes are more equitable. So right now we're operating on the building code 2015. We are trying to bump that up to 2018 or 2020. I'm awaiting the report from that advisory committee so we can move things forward. How are building codes more equitable, you may ask? Because if you have more current standards, you have better energy efficient buildings, you are more efficient in your living, so you're not using disproportionately more monies to live better because your building is better, it's more sustainable. And we know when we're thinking about affordable housing, we want that housing built in such a way that also saves money for those who are uh, having lower resources. So if we could have better standards in our building, people's money can go further and they can stretch what they have. And then lastly, industry support. We are tasked as, H as secretaries to go out and speak one to two times per week. And I do that. And when I do, I amplify the work that we're having at the agency through our goals and our strategic plan, and also the work of this advisory council and the governor, hoping to help those that I'm speaking with in those fields also think about how DEI can better be put to use in their areas. So the big picture of the work that I'm doing at the agency is my own DEI strategic plan, but then within the work, how do I infuse that work and reach out to those million license holders that we interact with every two years? So that is us in a nutshell. What I'd like to do next is hand it over to Anna Simpson, who has stepped in for Joaquin since he has stepped away. Anna will be providing the WIDA report. Anna. Thank you, Dawn. I appreciate it. Um, so to that point, I am stepping in for Joaquin using the slides that he created um, and listening to a little bit of what you shared, Dawn. If there's anything that... Um, this committee would like further elaboration on or more information, just let um, Mai know. Mai is on our team as well, Jean. Um, and we can certainly get back to you with more information, but um, providing an overview of the authority and um, relaying um, for this group um, what we do. Um, essentially, we are the state of Wisconsin's housing finance agency. Um, I do want to clarify though that 
we are an authority of the state, not an agency of the state. Um, so we do not receive any um, funding for our operations from the state of Wisconsin. We make our own money, um, which is a little bit of the differentiation with us being an authority. However, we were created under state statute and um, there are um, multiple things that we are you know, required to do under state statute as well. Um, so as the housing finance um, authority for the state of Wisconsin, we um, allocate the state's federal and state housing tax credits. So um, everything that we do is under the auspice of affordable housing. Um, and of what we do through tax credits and through other um, financing products is ensure that um, we are promoting the creation um, of affordable housing. So if you think about um, just development in general, um, if you have a market rate development, um, a developer can easily pencil that out. Um, so how do you encourage developers to wanna create affordable housing units within their developments? Um, we provide subsidies. So the, when we talk about the tax allocations, that is subsidy that assists um, developers um, to, in order to create affordable housing. Um, so again, besides the tax credit programs, we do have a variety of other products and um, services that assist with the creation, retention and improvement of, of affordable units. Um, and if I'm off the top of my head, last year we were about 2,700 affordable housing units on the multifamily side that were created. On the single family side, I believe there were around 3,000 um, people that we were able to assist through our partner lenders um, to get into low cost affordable mortgage um, financing products throughout the state of Wisconsin. So we're not a direct lender, we work through um, our lender network. Um, we also um, partner um, with agencies to um, administer housing choice vouchers um, throughout 48 of the 72 counties um, in the state of Wisconsin. Um, we have also in the past um, worked um, and allocated new market tax credits um, that um, can be fun, I would say, for us um, because we are able to get into not only affordable housing, but also some high impact community projects. This is something that we're um, looking at doing um, in the future. We haven't um, had tax credits for, I believe, two years last year. We didn't apply, um, but we definitely um, are looking at doing it again um, This in this current application. The NOFA just came out. Um, so we're looking at moving ahead with new market tax credits as well. So um, more to come on that. Um, we also support um, small businesses through um, economic development. We do have um, some guarantee loans. So if you think about USDA or SDA, those programs work similarly. With that said, we have been um, taking over the last year a step back to what economic development looks like within WIDA and trying to rethink how we really can make impact and not duplicate any programs that are already that exist out in the marketplace. So when I talk about our guarantee programs, those have been around for a couple of de decades. And quite frankly, they're probably a little stale and they do directly compete with USDA and SBA. And in many cases, more times than not, those programs are more attractive than ours. So talking about equity and inclusion and how we can um, be how we can represent better throughout the state of Wisconsin when we rethink economic development here at WIDA, that is at the forefront of the decisions that we're making. So looking at how do we increase the pipeline for um, emerging developers. Um, Dawn, you were talking about ensuring that, you know, not only are folks using um, high efficiency, you know, like how do you use on the construction side, how do you, um, create buildings that are more efficient and how do you use, you know, more sustainability, right, in, in construction, but also that does translate to um, the end user. So I'm so happy to hear you say that. But with that said, we also on the development side have had a lot of the same organizations in that space for a long time. So a lot of what we've been focusing on is how do you, in a way, um, create a hybrid of economic development through affordable housing and um, increase the pipeline of, of folks that are getting into um, 
this space as a development community and augmenting and supporting programs like Acre out of LISC um, and how can we grow and, and help support that. Um, we also, whoop, can we go back one more second? Last point, um, for our emerging business program, um, that also traditionally, whenever we have um, either tax um, allocation projects or new market tax credits, that is a component where we're looking at um, to the developers, who are they hiring in the communities um, and, and ensuring that on our end, we're holding our folks accountable for um, fishing from other ponds, right? We, we really are trying to create a space where um, they are looking at diversification in who they're hiring and hiring directly from the communities um, and providing that opportunity that does create some growth um, in economy um, and economies of scale within the projects that we're working on. So next slide, please. Um, some of uh, our initiatives that we have right now is supplier diversity. I'm super excited to say that over the last two years, our numbers that we've been reporting to DOA have significantly increased. Um, and even with our current project, I believe most people probably know that we're building a new headquarters. Our utilization of um, diverse um, vendors has been it, it, remarkable, but even if you take out our construction project, because obviously those are um, really high dollar spends that we have this year, our utilization has exponentially grown. So we're super excited about our work. Um, Jesse Greenlee um, on our community and economic development team leads those efforts and he's been doing um, an amazing job. With that, um, he also is intricately involved in our emerging development developer initiative. I chatted a little bit about that in the previous slide. Um, but again, that's a focus of ours. And with that, another thing that we did this last um, tax credit cycle was through our QAP, um, we created um, additional points to encourage partnerships between established developers and emerging developers and did it in a way um, recognizing that what we're trying to do for the emerging developers is not have them be partnered on paper only. We want them to have an equity um, an equity ownership in these developments. We want to grow their balance sheet. We want them to be able to stand on their own moving forward. So the better that partnership looked like in terms of that equity stake, the more points were allocated and we were actually blown away at the number of applications that came in requesting those points, which is super exciting. And it speaks to the fact that there, I think there is recognition that we need more diversification across the state um, in that space. And, and when we talk about our um, underserved communities, quite frankly, we are talking about rural. Rural is um, extremely underserved in the state of Wisconsin. We are talking about our communities of color. So it really is a broad, um, a broad statement when we talk about our underserved communities. It, it's not um, just in certain pockets of the state. It's really throughout the state that we are trying to really impact the diversity that um, the state of Wisconsin has. We really view Wisconsin almost as a microcosm of the United States. We have a little bit of everything um, and there's disparities all around. Um, supportive housing, um, again, another huge um, need in the state of Wisconsin. We have partnered with a CDFI, um, a national CDFI called um, CSH, um, it's Corporation for Supportive Housing. They um, have, uh, we've together have already done a about a four part series of webinars, which you can find on our website, starting to um, educate the community more on supportive housing. Um, and then also we will be um, instituting an institute um, that will bring in um, more information moving forward. Um, and next slide, which is the final slide. Um, I just wanna wrap up with, um, a couple more things. Um, we've had great success in really um, working with our Wisconsin tribal nations. Even um, with COVID, we continue to meet on a regular basis um, virtually. And as soon as things started easing up, maybe right before uh, the Delta variant started kind of picking things back up again, we got out um, to our communities and met with tribal leaders. Um, we have um, and our strategic market liaison, which is the last point on there. She is also our tribal leader. This was something that we did to think differently. Traditionally, our um, community and engagement folks were all territory, territory um, driven. 
and um, the strategic market liaison places a human centric um, approach on how we're serving our communities. We're looking at our underserved communities, particularly our communities of color through that role and how we can serve them better versus just a, a geographic focus on who we're serving. And then internally, um, in closing, we have really taken um, the opportunity over the last year to um, train our folks. Even though we all work in affordable housing, we don't want to take for granted that we all understand the history of redlining and how we got to where we're at with housing in the state of Wisconsin. So we've brought in local national speakers to really train um, our teams. And then also a number of committees internally um, um, that focus on employee and community engagement. We have constant lunch and learns. Um, this month, we're celebrating Native, um, Native American Heritage Month. So we've had several lunch and learns, but we're really taking these opportunities to educate our teams um, for us to just really have more cultural competence in how we move forward as employees. Um, and that helps with employee retention, learning and development and, and all of the above. So um, hopefully that was quick enough. Um, and again, if anybody ever wants any more information, happy to chat further. Great, Anna, thank you so much. We really appreciate this information and the way WIDA is thinking about the state and recognizing uh, the rural, and uh, minority housing needs. And then your work with the tribal nations is fantastic. So thank you so much. You did a wonderful job. And so our capacity building is now complete from the council standpoint. Of course, there's always documents and resources that you all can reach out to us and we will get and send your way. Now we are gonna turn our attention to the Bureau of Equity and Inclusion, Larice. Hello, everybody. It's been quite the wonderful morning, and I am so happy that I get to spend more time with you guys. I look forward to these meetings so much. Um, just some quick updates from the Bureau of Equity and Inclusion. Um, I'm the director of the Bureau of Equity and Inclusion, which a lot of you know, so my whole focus is not always just spent um, working with the Governor's Council. It's one of the things that we do. And today I'd like to give you some quick updates on a couple of the programs related to diversity, equity, and inclusion that, that are managed in the Bureau um, at DOA in the Division of Personnel Management. So can you please go to the next slide? Um, I hope that you all received a copy of the State of Wisconsin Student Diversity Internship Program flyer. This very popular program has increased in applicants by 52% in the last two years. So that's from 376 to 797 applications received for this program as of last year. Um, we're very excited that we will start accepting applications for this program starting December 6. And this student diversity program um, provides positions and opportunities that range from highly skilled to entry level and for, for students ages 18 and into the college, as long as they are enrolled in a college or university or technical school. And um, all, of, all of these offerings to the students um, give them an opportunity to be exposed to the different types of, of jobs and positions that are available in state government and gives them an opportunity to learn about those jobs and to leave with, with actual experience that they can put on their resume uh, around the, their career um, choice and those areas that they are studying in school. So we're really excited about this program. Um, students are exposed to networking opportunities. They um, are able to talk with other students from different agencies that are working in those other agencies. And they are also given the opportunity to learn how state government works and to get an understanding of what actually state employees do and what they're responsible for. So our goal is to let people know how wonderful working for the state is and to bring as many of those students on board um, so that we can continue to be a powerhouse um, in, in the state of Wisconsin. And just so you know, some of those positions will vary between remote, um, the hybrid, model and some are all in person. So there's a variety of opportunities for students. So please pass that flyer along. This is one of our very special programs. Um, can you move to the next slide please? 
Um, each year, our our um, count, uh, our bureau is also responsible for coordinating um, with the support of the state of Wisconsin's Women's Council, the Virginia Heart Award. And this year, this award was um, given out at um, on October 29th during our um, annual diversity award. And we really um, love this award because it recognizes those unsung heroes of, um, in, in state service. And it specifically recognizes women and their work. This award um, is in, um, was meant to allow us to um, celebrate women in state government. And this year's winner was Connie Chesky from the Department of Children and Families. And so we were honored to have her there as well as Secretary Emerson to um, um, give her her award and congratulate her on her 36 years of dedicated services to the state of Wisconsin. Can you move to the next slide, please? Another, um, the Bureau also staffs the State Council on Affirmative Action. And this council acts as an advisory council to the Division of Personnel Management. We also coordinate the SCAA Annual Diversity Awards. Um, and this year, they were held again on October 29th in conjunction with the Virginia Heart Award at the state capitol. And the ceremony is online. If any of you would like to go back and watch it, it was videotaped and it is on a YouTube. So you can go back and see it was a wonderful ceremony, wonderful day of celebrating diversity, equity and inclusion in the state of Wisconsin and all of the innovative things that are being done in this state. The governor, the Lieutenant Governor and the First Lady were also in attendance as they have been every year um, that, that I've been um, helping to move this project forward and that the governor has been in office and to help to um, provide those awards to the winners. So as you can see, here is a list of the council members for that um, the State Council on Affirmative Action. And actually you can see that a Dean Palo is on this council and on, on, the, um, on our council too. And also you can see who are the winners of those various diversity awards. And um, I just wanted to recognize that, you know, Department of Health Services, um, Department of Children and Families, um, and, and, and just the University of Whitewater, University of Platteville, Platteville, I mean, they have done some outstanding work. And even during the time of a pandemic, they, they still rose to the occasion and, and, and made themselves unknown. So we wanted to congratulate them and we wanted to share this with you. And we hope that next year you guys will be in attendance at the next award ceremony. Can you um, please move to the next slide? Oh, and we also wanted to thank some of the council members who stepped up and were our keynote speakers during the SCAA Diversity Awards on October 29th. So thank you so much to Marie Summers and Joaquin Otero for presenting um, such wonderful information to the, to, the, to the people in the audience at our Diversity Awards ceremony. Um, they were inspiring. And they really, really brought forth, you know, a, a recognition of how important this work is um, and that we do every day. So um, are there any questions about any of the updates that I've given so far? Okay, well, thank you very much. Next slide, please. Yep, and with that now, we are going to transition from our state agency updates and the awards and the council uh, diversity uh, affirmative action council work to the meat and potatoes of what we're about to do. We are jumping into work plans. And what we share from day one is we were not just gonna task you with creating the plan. We wanted to be sure that you have the resources and the details on how to formulate the plan. And so this morning, we're going to, Larissa is going to talk about planning for change, developing that work plan with some templates. And we in our small group discussion are going to develop our guiding statements for the work plan. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Larissa. Thank you, Secretary Cram. Excited to go over this with you. 
So when we started this year, each subcommittee received a general charge. And each subcommittee was asked to review this charge and then to identify priorities around this broader charge to address during their current appointment cycle. And then after identifying these priorities to develop a work plan to address them. Next slide, please. Okay. As this is a, a, a process in and of itself, I'd like for you to consider these steps in providing um, your, your, your process and in, 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 in guiding your process in developing your work plan um, for, for this work. Each of you should have received a copy of a, a little booklet that was put together to help you to guide you through this work that needs to take place in developing your work plan. And I hope that if you have any questions or you have any concerns about how you're going to craft this, how you're going to make this look, that you please reach out to me and um, the staff and we will definitely be there to, uh, to assist you with that. So when you think about these steps, the um, first one that, um, can, you, can you go back for a moment, Deanna? Okay, not that far. <laughs> yeah, preparation. So we're going to walk through each of these um, items on this, um, this continuum here, where we're gonna look at preparation, what is involved in research and information gathering? What do we mean by research finding, plan development, and Im implementation, reporting, and evaluation. So next, next slide, please. Okay. So when you started to work on identifying your priorities, that would be your preparation. And we wanted you to think about asking yourself as a subcommittee, you know, what are the questions that you need to to consider. So this is where you're brainstorming. This is where as a group, you guys have been coming together and you have been talking about you know, what's important to us. And you can tell from the subcommittee reports that we received this morning that a lot of you have given a lot of thought into those areas that you want to dig in a little bit deeper, that you want to, to, to find out more about and identify the specific challenges that you want to address during this time. And also, we, I want to make sure that the subcommittee start to consider about, you know, how are you going to address that? What do you need to know about that priority in order to make those changes? And then identifying your overall reject, uh, objective and how you will know that these changes will make a difference. And we talked about this a little bit in the last meeting where we really dove into, you know, data, the importance of data and starting to, to look for that data, whether it be quantitative data, a lot of the reports that you guys have been asking for around workforce and those types of things, as well as qualitative data, because you wanna hear from the people who are gonna be impacted by the changes that you're going to make. And so thinking about how you're going to gather that is very, very important, okay? So the subcommittee should also think about how they will collect and process this information once they start to gather it. Um, each subcommittee is expected to submit three results as they work through this process. The first one would be their research findings. In other words, as you're, as you're looking through the data, as you're analyzing it, as you are uh, comparing the data that you gathered to answer the questions that you have about your priority, you know, what does that look like? What, what, are the, what are the steps that you took in order to do that? As well as your equity work plan, that you will need to submit also to the large council. And then how you are going to deliver those annual updates, those will be expected from the council. And prior to presenting any of this information, um, Secretary Krim and um, the vice chair, Mai, will be meeting with those subcommittees to review those plans and make sure that they are going in the right direction, the direction that we need them to go in, in order to gain the results that you are looking for as a subcommittee. As you remember, when we just heard from the lieutenant governor, it's like, how are we going to make this work not transactional, but transformational? So can you go to the next slide, please? All right, so when you start to think about the 
piece where we're talking about where you're going to research your findings. Um, here are some examples of ways to collect and process and review that data that you have been collecting. So one of the things that you might want to do, and you have been doing, is looking at different websites, reviewing available information. You know, what is out there? What, what can we use? Interviewing and scheduling key individuals to provide information. Some of you have been reaching out to some of the presenters that we have had come to the large council and having them come to your subcommittee meetings to provide you with additional information. Are there people that you might want to talk to just to get a little bit more information about the impact? That would be initiating your group discussions as well as bringing those people into your subcommittee to have various discussions with them and understand what that would look like. Once you start to collect all of these different various types of data, you want to compile it together and synthesize these results by, you know, looking at, you know, where, where is this data taking me? What are the things that this data is pointing out? And again, at any point, please feel free to reach out to our bureau to, to provide support or guidance and assistance in this work. You also have your mentors to help too with each of the subcommittees. So, after you've done that, we want you to submit a draft report to the um, secretary and um, the chair and vice chair so that they can kind of see where you're going with this process. Can you go to the next slide, please? And as you start to think about how you're going to put those research findings together, I, um, inside of that guide, you'll find some of these questions. And these questions are, are, are not written in stone. I mean, you don't have to follow them one step after the other, but they are there as a resource for you to help you to, to guide you in putting your research findings into a narrative that can be presented to explain how you came to the conclusions that you came to as you think about the work that you want to do moving forward. And in also helping you to you know, structure that narrative that you are planning to provide um, to the secretary, um, to the chair and vice chair of the subcommittees. Okay, thank you. Can you go to the next slide? So now we come to thinking about your, your work plan, your equity work plan. So when, when, when looking at this, you're going to start to look at your research findings. And this is where you're going to, to, to draw on those research findings to help you to determine what exactly is going to go into your plan. And each plan should be designed to achieve a select objective um, of, of, for each of the priorities and goals of the subcommittee. So what is the objective of that priority that you have identified? And based upon the, 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 the conversation in the subcommittee, um, you're going to say, you know, these are our two major priorities, and these are the two major objectives of those priorities. And this can kind of lead you into the next step. What are the strategies and actions that you want to address to help you to achieve those objectives? Now, remember, those actions, those, those strategies can be activities that will, will move the conversation, will move and advance the work, or they can be supported recommendations that you're making about things that we need to consider and work on at, at any state level. Okay, and you want to make sure that those actions are, of course, you know, the, the, the specific, measurable, attainable, relative, relevant, and timely. You know, everyone knows this acronym, the SMART one. So just keeping that in mind, um, I just wanted to put it up there. <laughs> uh, but, and also make sure that in reviewing your plans that there's some discussion about resources time commitment, staffing, uh, accountability built into who's going to do what and how are we going to get it done? And is it actually achievable? And then how are we going to evaluate our progress? Are we ahead of the schedule? Are we behind the schedule? Are we meeting our, our, our goals, our timelines, our benchmarks in performing this work? So that is the next thing. Next slide, please. Okay, so with plan consideration, I just want you to think about what we just talked about. Identify the goals, you know, identify the strategies and actions, 
um, create some performance measures that you are going to use to measure the work, and then identify the tools that you're going to use to track. Keep track of the progress that you are making step by step. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? So what we've done also in that, in that um, information that I sent you was to provide you with sample templates in which you can use to put your, 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 your work into a workable plan that you can present for people to be able to look at and say, oh, so this is what they're going to be working on. And the plan is broken down into identifying the goal or priority that you have, the objective that is related to that priority or goal, and then the strategies and actions that you're going to be taking in order to meet that goal. And so each of the examples in the template that has been provided for you also has um, just one that you can copy and paste and type right into and work on to make this work easier for you to, to accomplish. You don't have to recreate this chart. And again, like I said, anytime you have a question or you need any assistance with this, please reach out to us. We are more than happy to support you. Here's another example of the exact same work that was put in the previous work template. It shows the exact same activities, but just in a different, different way to look at it. And sometimes visually understanding something is very important. So as a subcommittee, you need to look at which one of these templates best represents or best demonstrates to those outside what it is that we're trying to do. And you can choose from either one of these that you like or you feel that works better for you in your group. So with that said, um, Secretary Krim, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about the small group discussions that we're gonna be taking next. Thank you all. And if you have any questions for me, you can direct them directly to me through email or if you wanna put them in the chat. So thank you so much, everybody. Great. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you for all of your good work and really laying out the plan that could be followed, loose guidelines, if each subcommittee chooses. We realize sometimes people work differently, sometimes people think differently, but we wanted you to at least start with a game plan. And that game plan could be one you keep, one you don't keep, some parts you keep, purely up to you as a subcommittee and how you wish to do this work. But again, the Bureau of Equity and Inclusion with uh, Larissa's lead wanted to ensure that you had the resources to do the work and make people available to get you the data you need to do the work. So what we are gonna do this morning is start that work. We are with going to use the next 45 minutes to have small group discussions, and that's going to be three groups. We're going to break each group, each subcommittee up into its own group. You will have a facilitator that is not a member of your group, so everybody can be fully focused and do the work they need to do on behalf of the subcommittee. And you'll have a note taker, also not a part of your group. The two people will be there to support the conversation, to capture the notes, so that we can then send those group notes back to the subcommittees for your next meeting. We realize some of you have your next meeting already scheduled. You may learn from this activity this morning. You may need to add uh, another subcommittee or length of the time to get to the deliverable of the action plan toward the end of January in preparation for the February meeting. So I just want to emphasize that to you today. But what we will do is we will break up into three groups. Uh, one committee will actually stay in this main room. The other two will be dispatched to other subcommittee rooms so that you can do this very work. At the end of that work, you will not report out. Those notes will be better crafted and sent to you so you can use them in advance of your subcommittee work. There will be one large one group that stays in the large meeting room. I actually will lead that group. That is the community engagement subcommittee and Deb Southworth will be the note taker. The economic and business development subcommittee will be facilitated by Mai Zong, our uh, vice chair, and that note taker will be Nicole Bally. And then our 
The third group data and policy will be facilitated by Larice Lincoln and Anissa Points will uh, be that note taker. When we're all done at 11.45, we will reconvene back into the large room and I will provide our closing of the council meeting for this morning. So with that, Larice, I will um, have you all be prepared to move. But before we do that, the instruction of what will happen in that subcommittee meetings in those small rooms, we are going to develop our guiding statement. When we develop that guiding statement, that is really going to be the touchstone that looks at the priorities of that subcommittee and flushes out the details of the plan. So it's sort of, sort of the opening, the introduction. And so an example statement is to identify policy and process changes that level the opportunities and eliminate disparities in opportunity for Wisconsin citizens. If that is what we're doing as the example statement, as we do our work today in guiding, creating our guiding statement to reflect that, we're gonna answer these four questions. I'm not gonna read them to you because you have them on your screen and you will have them in hand when we move to our subcommittees. But again, we're just trying to develop a guiding statement for what our action plan is going to do. And so we're gonna get started with that this morning. We will now be dispatched to our rooms. And so I will ask that, thank you. I was gonna say, if you could put the focus on the people. <laughs> and so Secretary Kolar, thank you for your leadership of the subcommittee. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank everybody for being present in the group. Uh, Alex G, uh, Nazarene, Mai Zong, uh, Dr. Odawa. Did I get it right this time? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and my job and uh, Greg, as well as Jessica Cavazos. So uh, what we're going to do, and you all received all of the information in advance. So you have a ch had a chance to look at it. This uh, will bring it to life. But essentially, what we're wanting to do is help you come up with your guiding statement. So when you think about your priorities that you've listed, and you notice we actually used a small example from your, your team uh, in the work plan, so you actually could kind of see send some of the things you've been saying in action. So what I'd like to do is move our attention to the four questions. Before I do that, does anybody have questions? Uh, Dr. Odawa, uh, Odawa, question or no? Nope. All right. So I'm going to have uh, Deb Southworth is going to do her best attempt at collecting these notes so that you all could be fully focused on the questions. And so when you think about your subcommittee, question number one, what does the committee goals really mean to you as subcommittee members? What does your goal, your committee goals mean to you? And you don't have to raise your hand. There's only, you know, eight of us. So please jump in, whoever wants to answer that first question. All right. I might have to call on people, but I want to be nice. <laughs> I'll All go right. ahead. Thanks, Desiree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, subcommittee goals mean to me, um, it's a form of education. So it's educating and collaborating with one another um, with, and bonding on with our similarities and our differences um, and learning from one another. Um, I am a huge proponent of education and learning um, from other individuals, uh, cultural practices and religious beliefs and what um, our subcommittee goals mean to me. Great. Thank you for sharing that. So educating. So you're not keeping it to yourself. You want the world, all 72 counties of Wisconsin to know what this committee is doing. So it's about education. 
Others, what does your subcommittee goals mean to you? The committee I'm goals. Here. Yep. I'm, this is my here. And one of the things that I'm always very conscientious about when I'm working in the subcommittee is the acknowledgement of who is in the 72 counties. Um, I'm a big proponent, like, um, like Nassim, too, about education. Um, but I think oftentimes the acknowledgement is missing because sometimes that education component, there may not be resources, funding, um, pe people power to do that. But, but acknowledgement from the dominant culture is also very important. Great. Thank you for sharing that because you're right. We could educate, but if you don't know who, who you're being educated by or on, it, it may fall on deaf ears. So Correct. nice connecting or, point. Yeah. Or even miseducation Ooh. if it's not an authentic voice. Thank you. Uh, it's Greg. I'll, I'll jump in. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to use the, it, it's along the same lines, but I think democratizing access, um, you know, allowing along the same lines of the county, like all sorts of uh, greater access, greater ability to self-define and explain or present to the, to the rest of the, uh, of the state. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, Dr. G? Um, uh, thank you, Secretary Krim. You know, I also think of um, intentionality. So often when government-led um, or bureaucratic-led efforts happen, people think that it's knee-jerk reaction and that the, the, the thought isn't to be intentional. And so the idea of thinking openly and giving forethought to what we want to do, what we want to celebrate, what we want to recognize, I think is important for the people to understand that there's some real thought given to this. And it's not a reaction, but it's an action to the need for being more inclusive. Oh, I like that. Not reactionary, intentional. Yes. Around the celebration. Yep. Thank <clears throat> Just thinking about unity as well. Um, and when we do celebrate um, <clears throat> certain aspects, um, like celebration of life, celebration of water, um, we, we do our ceremonies, um, so on and so forth. But I, I feel of, as though um, there's a sense of unity that's brought together when we're telling our stories, whether it be about um, the existence of, of of um, certain elements or just personal stories that, that we're thinking about. So we're kind of constructing this knowledge um, that really helps us unify each other as well as um, strengthen our identity. And so those are a few things, a few thoughts that come to mind, um, unity and identity. Nice. Thank you very much. Kind of knowing how you strengthen it, really telling the story and the why behind the story. I like that. So are we ready to move on to question number two? I am gonna remind us your charge is to create and sustain an environment that regularly scans for, recognizes and celebrates diversity, equitable and inclusive practices and initiatives, community and state cultural events, significant activities and efforts. From the answers from question number one, I heard intentionality on what we select to highlight and celebrate. Acknowledging the who the people are and the why we are uh, celebrating, as well as um, democratizing it. I believe what Greg was saying there was the self-definition of who is being celebrated and why, not what the majority culture thinks they are doing or who they are, but authentically who they are. Okay, I wanted to make sure I'm capturing that appropriately. And then uh, Dr. Odawa believes if we are authentic and that and intentional in that approach, telling that story of the existence and actually educating and acknowledging will help raise the identity and acknowledge what we're talking about. So I wanna make sure that summary was somewhat accurate. Okay, gonna to move to question number two. So how does the subcommittee's charge relate to accomplishing the goal? That's a tough one, I know. I see people are like, hmm, 
I can see the wheels turning. Um, I believe that promoting unity and acknowledgement and education um, all tie into promoting a more inclusive environment, um, a more culturally aware environment, and an environment that will foster um, more understanding and respect. Nice, more culturally aware, which can lead to fostering respect. Gotcha. Understanding and respect. Yes. Understanding, thank you. And I love that you're taking that approach, but I'm really coming from like a sustainability of, re, of recruitment and retention of, of talent within the state. You know, I, I'm constantly thinking about coworkers and their families that leave our state because they're not finding a sense of home here or they're choosing to raise their families out of state because even though they may have been a resident of Wisconsin, we as a state are not providing them with outside of nine to five needs. You know, um, so that's really what, um, that's the lens that I'm coming and is really looking at also the recruitment of retention of um, individuals that I wanna stay, that I want them to stay in the state of Wisconsin. So what I like about both is and this subcommittee will need to determine which lens they want to focus on with their action plans and their work plans, because of course, both are valid. What I'm hearing you say, Mai, is after we're more culturally aware and people have that fostering of understanding and respect, you want that to lead to more recruitment and those that are participating to feel valued and a sense of belonging. And well, is those, yeah. that, theory, that thread? It's, it's kind of like that math formula where I'm, I'm hoping that it's through, you know, that it's fruition of understanding and that, you know, an understanding of the different cultures leads to an environment that is inclusive, thus creating, you know, um, for recruitment and retention families that want to stay in the region, stay in the state. Great. So it, you wanted to really result in recruitment, retention, and stay. Not just an awareness or a respect, but that result in is because they feel they belong. Correct. And I think that's something that's more measurable because I think with 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 the first one, it's more of a very qualitative, you know, and, and I think that's really hard to find. Whereas with a quantitative, we can actually look at residency numbers and, 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 and diversity of residents that are choosing to stay in the state. Gotcha. Thank I you. completely I completely agree with that. And even going off of that, how do we and how can we measure that? And how do we ensure that people are minority individuals are being retained in these positions. How do we ensure that the hiring of individuals goes along with our goals um, and makes minority individuals feel safe as well? Great. It's kind of a envelope wraparound. I like that. I see the, the movement and just how the discussion of that question coming at it from two different lenses actually began to conflate. Secretary Krim? Yes. May I also add, um, I think we shouldn't lose um, the importance of the qualitative piece because it's very easy to say, and I think about this as my day as a former recruiter from UW-Madison undergrad admissions, whenever we lose students or lose employees, the, 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 the rhetoric is, well, Michigan offered them more money or Ohio State had more money or they had they made them an offer they couldn't refuse. So merely looking at the quantitative data could just mean, well, they had better opportunities. How could we stop the advancement of people of color? But if there's a qualitative, more narrative narrative piece added, almost like an exit interview, so that we're, and this is part of what's we're thinking through with our Center for Black Excellence and Culture, we've got to find ways to, to measure this because sometimes if you just talk with people, they will explain things to you like, I took a job here, but I sent my daughter back to Florida to finish high school because she just didn't fit in here. Or I'm an executive for, for a major company, but I have not spent one weekend in Madison in nine years of living here because of the lack of feeling at home. I, I think the loss of them tells one story, but the interview, the qualitative data is just, it's just so um, damning that I think we have to have a way to help people, help people to understand 
this is affecting our state's economic bottom line if we don't get a handle on it. Thank you for adding that. So as you all move to your work plans, it will behoove you to think about how you do measure it qualitative and quantitatively to get at your goal. So we're gonna make sure we write that down so we don't lose sight of that, but so true. How is gonna be the question. Shall and we stay with this one? Go ahead. Bye. Well, I, I'm just I'm just gonna add to Dr. Gee, I cannot agree more, um, particularly with the honesty and the candid that people may uh, provide um, with the safety of visibility or maybe even through language or cultural affinity that there might be more honest and candid answers. So I, I cannot agree more, particularly with underrepresented populations that we're serving. Nice. So I just had a light bulb, but remember, I'm not your subcommittee. I'm just here facilitating. But one thing that could be measurable or a component of that work plan that you're mentioning is if you're present at an event that is celebrated and amplified, perhaps there is a survey or a takeaway that you could send to the promoter or the originator of the event to ask some of these very questions that could get you maybe some of that data, both quantitative and qualitative. And so it's not necessarily you all, you know, roving reporters at the event, but it's when you think about what events you've selected to celebrate and highlight that you are trying to amplify, maybe there's a, a matrix or a feedback loop that they respond to as a result of your efforts. And that might better inform what is happening to support your charge. Just a thought. Shall we move to number three or does anyone else wanna answer how does the subcommittee charge relate to accomplishing the goals? All right, I'm going to move us over to the third question. Again, though, I'm going to read your charge. Create and sustain an environment that regularly scans for, recognizes, and celebrates diversity, equitable, and inclusive practice and initiatives, community and state cultural events, significant activities, and efforts. So thinking about our guiding statement, question number three. What does the subcommittee value as most important in accomplishing the goal? So thinking about your values and the values of the people that you wish to celebrate, the activities, the cultural events of what they wanna celebrate, that you wanna amplify, what is it that you value most about accomplishing that goal? How will you feel? How will you feel like you have made that impact? That's what we're talking about. What do you value in doing this work? I just, I would say sort of freedom, you know, freedom of expression. <clears throat> and I think about freedom of um, thoughts and um, freedom to express song as well as dance tradition um, and so that's and and just back to the qualitative um, we've talked about the qualitative data that's that's right on as far as um, understanding um, because just working with data currently in our institution uh, we're we're looking at I mean there's just so many uh, words or numbers don't tell the complete story um, behind um, what our, you know, what, I'm just trying to put this in the context, what our, <clears throat> what, what our community is facing right now. And so um, one, one area I had trouble with kind of condensing, because I worked with qualitative data quite a bit is it's such, such rich data. How do we capture that story from each individual? And so it's been, uh, it's been quite a challenge, but um, just back to the value, it's just freedom. Um, because we didn't always have the freedom to express um, through our traditions and our and our and our way way of life. Okay, thank you for sharing that. So, what you value is 
the freedom of people to, in a safe way, in a celebratory way, be acknowledged in educating others. And then in that, more people would know about it. So they are free to express themselves in song and dance without fearing retribution or fearing that they are constantly educating because we are helping to actually uh, amplify what's happening. Does that capture or am I somewhere else? No, that was really good. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Others, what do you value in what this work will happen? Dr. G? Two things come to mind for me. One is perseverance in these efforts because I think we all have the experience that we come out of the gates or the starting blocks really strong, sort of like the old quarter mile but it's the last 50 or 60 meters, you just want to step off the track and just, you know, I'm okay not finishing. <laughs> I can still get on the bus and go, <laughs> go back to the school. Uh, this is optional. I think people start off really strong and then they experience backlash that they'd not anticipated, thinking that that backlash is a sign that they're doing the wrong thing so that they stop. I think partner with that though, uh, Madam Secretary, is also accountability. Because when these efforts happen, I, you know, I thought it was you. No, I thought it was you. I thought it was the committee. No, I thought it was the secretary. I, who's responsible for it? Who can make the budget call? Who can make the decision? Who can make the website admission? Uh, um, 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 admission? Whatever it is we need to do, where does the buck stop? How are decisions being made? Because I've, I have found that DEI, affirmative action, inclusive, whatever we've called it, we give it sexier names every decade but they, they tend to lack accountability, which makes them the same soup warmed over. If there's strong accountability, holding agencies accountable, department administrators, managers, secretaries, whomever accountable, if that's very clear and if that is upheld, that says to folks on the front line, this is what's different. There is, there's accountability. If it's marketing, if it's, if it's um, um, uh, information, um, sciences or technology, if it's if it's accountable, it all has a person with whom the buck stops. Diversity is usually with someone who has no staff and no power to hold their peers accountable. So that, I, I'm sorry, I got on a soapbox a little bit. Accountability and perseverance. That's all right. I like when you say it looks sexier every decade. <laughs> You're right. It does. Everybody said it's what we want to do. And then we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And you see the tape. <laughs> and you don't quite cross it. So what I appreciate about what you've shared in talking about perseverance of the effort, it's as you celebrate and amplify that freedom of expression, how is it mirrored back by state government? How is it mirrored back with resources to help those events continue to be sustainable? What support is being provided that shows it's not just the new sexy definition, it's something that we want to keep at the forefront. And so when I think about it, when you're thinking about your action plans and your guiding statement, when you come up with whatever that is, you also want to give a responsibility to state government to sustain it, to keep it going, and to keep the relationship between the organization you've built this new relationship with so that they know they could also count on government to support it. Because if we're saying this is what we're doing, we have a subcommittee that says we need to celebrate and educate and be respectful and mindful. They got to feel that warmth back to them and knowing that it's not just a flash in the pan. It's going to continue on and they'll be supported. Did that capture some of that? Yes. Okay. So others, Jessica, you've been kind of quiet. I hate to call people out, but I just, I know you're with us and you see it a lot in terms of the, 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 the chamber work that you're doing. What do you value most when you think about accomplishing? What's the most important thing with this goal? I don't know. I might've called her out. She might've stepped away. We're going to let her jump in at some point, though. Greg's hand was up, too, Madam. Oh, I'm sorry, Greg. Uh, well, okay. I, I was waiting. I, uh, I, I want to, um, I think there's some notion of, like, um, 
fertilizing or pr provocation. So, it, you know, in a positive sense. So, not just sustaining and holding accountable, but you know, state government can do very little by standing still, right? By just having policies or folks who who don't value a particular position, that can happen. So I think that, you know, um, a, a part of accountability might be a proactive sense. Uh, we should value, I think, a proactive state that says that these things are important. What can we always be doing, not only to sustain, but to cultivate more, um, to welcome more, to aggressively go out to those communities where maybe the scan is people are unaccounted for in our conversations. So, so some value on incentivizing, a state that incentivizes good behavior and in, in, in participation. Can you go a little deeper for me on that? Well, I think about, I'm thinking about the federal government when it has an environmental office and decides not to act on environment, right? Depending on who they choose to place in, in those offices. So the same, the, the question here is what can, how can we value or create a, a system of accountability that ensures that doesn't happen, right? It's easy to sort of say every um, uh, chamber or county will have a checkbox that says, when you wanna tell us about your events, we're open to inclusion, just tell us it's diverse, right? Or it's a, a, of a, but something else to sort of go out and say, we are looking to make sure you are here and we're creating vehicles that speak to meaningfully to you that you can present out to everyone else, or we're providing financial resources to elevate um, your interest, commitments, you know, um, areas of action. So I, I just I think that you know it's one thing to sort of say we're going to strengthen what's there by by holding people and staff accountable. It's another thing to say not only are you accountable, but you have to you have to have wonder, you have to have curiosity to do more. And you, you should be on a path that sort of interrogates what else can we regularly be doing. Okay, that helps. It, it sounds like what you're saying is, when you think about the amplification and the celebration of these communities, if, you're go, if we're gonna acknowledge them and list them, it's not enough to just list it. We want to maybe have some criteria around what gets listed so that people aren't treating it as a box check. We might wanna talk about, talk with those counties to say, hey, this event, this activity is happening annually in your area. Are you funding it? How are you supporting it? Yes, the governor's subcommittee has acknowledged it and we see it, but for it to be sustained, we have to see it, but you have to see it as supported as well. It's both and. Does that yeah, yeah, I mean, I think as, some of it? as you say that back to me, I think about like state as incubator, right? So we see that in business. How do we see that in getting these things out as well? So the business of culture, the business of diversity, the business of welcoming and, and helping people feel safe and trusted and that it's worth going out on that limb, particularly uh, if you're a, a, a minoritized community in a big or small area of the state, right? Like there's a lot to sort of say, I'm, they're not interested in me or I shouldn't raise my head. So I think the state is incubator uh, in the areas you just mentioned makes sense. I like that, Greg. I think what I heard you say actually pulls into bear a lot of what Mai was saying about recruitment and retention and people staying. So a state as incubator around the business of culture, when you think about some of these communities that have participation, when that participation is gone, they're losing their people. They're not retaining their people. So it's showing what the research that this subcommittee has done shows the benefit of amplifying those cultural events and how ultimately it leads to or can lead to the retention of that workforce and those families in those communities. Okay, oh, all right, I like that heads up. I felt like that might've been a stretch, but it's, I just was like incubation, recruitment, retention, people should stay. And it's because it's amplified and those communities also value, but the gov government as lead. 
to, to shine a bright light on that. All right. If nobody else has a value statement burden question there, I'm going to move us to that fourth question because I want to leave some time for us to think about this discussion and then to start adding some bricks to that guiding statement from what we're discussing here. So that fourth question, what are the subcommittee's unique values or shared principles that you want reflected in the statement? So what basically what that is asking is, what has been the connective tissue of this discussion that can really guide this work for this subcommittee? Madam Secretary, I'll jump in. All right. I, two things come to mind. One is that um, a, a unique value is that we believe that this effort is not a zero sum game. We still wrestle with the fact that people think to make strides for minoritized people, people of color, marginalized groups, it means the loss of another group. I mean, that's really at, at the heart of this, I believe. So I think making sure that we, that we take time to understand what that means. When committees like ours or groups like us look at diversity initiatives, we look at the people whose groups need protection or help or support, and I, and I believe in that, that's all right. But the majority culture still is not advanced in thinking and understanding this. That when we say, hey, it's a good thing to be inclusive, inclusive right, right, right. We're assuming that everyone's nodding and saying right. Others are not thinking that. They're thinking, are, are you telling me the way we've done things is wrong? If I'm white and male, I'm wrong. Someone has to be responsible for bringing that group along because by and large, they're still in power. So not just for a philosophical perspective, but for a practical power perspective, we need to bring them along. Second thing I want to stress is that we're really not creating anything new. We are repeating our history. And I think that there's something very rich in telling people we've been here before. When I think about Oktoberfest, when I think about um, the, the Scandinavian culture, when I think about um, those are minoritized groups because Wisconsin was, was Native American. It was, you know, it's Native. And so when these other groups came in, they found themselves small and they started celebrating their religious holidays and their cultural backgrounds. We became known, you know, for strong Scandinavian and German heritage after we came and, you know, took over. It was what we're talking about. These were groups that wanted to celebrate the culture of the homeland of the, of the old land here. What we're talking about is not news. We have to have people to understand that what attributed contributed to Wisconsin's economy, how it was established, how it works, how it functions, um, even how it set up its government and supporting of you know, agriculture all came out of our ethnic roots and experiences. So let's help people to understand we have new groups that have been minoritized. And if the celebration of this uh, of the immigrants of this state has helped to shape Wisconsin, don't we wanna to continue to evolve for the betterment of our state and its economy and its universities? And so I love showing that we've done this before with great success when people become fearful of new endeavors. Well stated. I mean, when you think about that unique value, drawing on the history, you, you're you're absolutely correct, and and just those two examples really, I think, helps the subcommittee members go, yeah, you're right. It it, it was Native American. Now we're talking about Oktoberfest. Right. So how do how do we continue the evolution? What can this subcommittee do in its guiding statement and in its actions? continue to build on so it's a plus one, not a reduction of someone else. Because it's hard to critique our efforts when we are recognizing history. What would what would Milwaukee be without the, and I'm simplifying, but what would yeah. Milwaukee be without the influence of beer and sausage? That's, that's German influence. And so I think helping people to understand we're way more diverse, which means we have greater ingenuities. Why are we not using them? And what if someone had stifled German influence, Scandinavian influence. Wow. Others. 
I think what, um, Dr. Gee, thank you for your statement because that prompted me to think about what we've already institutionalized that we can further support. You know, so I thought of like Act 31. Yeah. This is something that is yep. within our educational system that is supposed to, again, start with our public education with our children to be aware of our indigenous First Nations people and as a state. But what are we doing as a state to be good stewards of Act 31? Whereas is there money, is there people, you know, or is it again, just like, was that what was sexy back in the 80, 80s? And now, you know, and so that got me to think about what have, what has already been institutionalized that needs a spotlight that we can, that naturally works with our subcommittee. Well stated. Other thoughts on this subcommittee's unique values or shared principles that you want reflected in this statement? All right, I'm not gonna stay there. I'm gonna circle back to all four questions and what we have articulated, I wanna check with our note taker because these notes are gonna be so important. So I wanna make sure Deb, you um, have been able to capture what has been shared. Is there any clarification you feel like you may need on any question or from anyone in particular in the group? I don't think so. I don't have the overall statement that you shared a couple times. I tried to catch it, but I know we've got that somewhere. So I'm not so concerned. The statements that have been made so far, I, I think I'm caught up and and getting at least the core core here and in many any many cases the full quote. So doing good. Great. And I know with this group, people are taking their own notes as well. So when you get to your subcommittee, even though you're going to have these wonderful notes from Deb and Secretary Kolar is going to lead this discussion, you will have your own notes and you will be so ready to jump in to think about how you will develop your guiding statement. And so remember, you've been conducting research, you've been gathering information, you want to ensure that what you've gathered so far will speak to where you're going in this guiding statement. But there were, you know, a lot of wonderful themes that I've heard articulated here. Um, when you think about questions three and four that really get to what's most important in accomplishing the goal, what do you value and what is the shared principle reflected, that connective tissue is really the backbone of where you're going with your action plan. And it sounds like, one, you all are passionate about ensuring that there is at least an illumination of who is in Wisconsin and how might you amplify what is your role in helping others know, acknowledge who is here, respect who is here so that they too can have the freedom to fully express themselves and in having that acknowledgement of that freedom may be apt to feel like they belong or feel like this is a place they want to stay. This is a place that they feel celebrated. But it also is a way of connecting big government with local government to say, if we're doing this, how are you too supporting it? What is your role? How are you gonna be accountable to these citizens that have the opportunity to amplify what they do? Because much like the German and Polish background, how sausage, beer, and cheese is celebrated. 30 years from now, we may be celebrating the fruits and the emphasis of these communities. They will become a part of the infrastructure of the state of Wisconsin. And so it's not diminishing or taking something away. It's saying, we got beer, sausage, and cheese. What's next? And how do we get those perspectives amplified as part of 
who we are as Wisconsinites. And, and so they feel their belonging and connection to. Those were sort of the values I was hearing. That was some of the movement I was hearing, but I don't wanna put words in your mouth. That's what I was hearing, but I would just add also the, the commerce behind beer, cheese, and sausage. Yes. Money that has brought the state of Wisconsin and the national, notor the world's notoriety. Yep. I have to add to hunting um, because the historical um, reference to hunting. Um, so there's a long history of uh, hunting practice within tribes and um, glad my had mentioned um, Act 31. Um, because we don't often hear that um, one of the reasons why um, Dakota aren't here is because Ojibwe kind of pushed them out west. And part of it was that they're following um, the whitetail. And so that was part of it. Um, not, not the whole entire reason, but that's something that we need to be more intentional about, intentional about learning as far as um, our educational system in Act 31. And so I always think about that purpose. What's the purpose of, of, um, of, of everything that we're, we're teaching or doing or um, celebrating? Thank you for adding that. Because the other thing you want to think about is cool. as you think about what you're celebrating, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, Juneteenth Day or, you know, Day of the Dead. It also could be, celebrating those distinct hunting seasons that take place that are unique to this state and why. And so amplifying the why so that people understand what some of the issues are that are being debated where people don't actually have the real information behind it. This group could be part of that real information. So thanks for that example, Dr. Ottawa. Yeah, I was just think think about the um, celebration of um, uh, the Voight decision that affirmed the right to hunt, fish, and gather within ceded territory for all yeah. Ojibwe, Ojibwe in Wisconsin. And then uh, and then it also included in 99 when uh, Mille Lacs also were included under that 1837 treaty. So they were also, um, they also extended that right to hunt, fish, and gather within ceded territory. So, um, so these are all part of Wisconsin. I mean, especially when you think about the deer season coming up <laughs> right, right around the corner, yeah. we yeah. have to think about well, who brought that, um, uh, who who hunted here first <laughs> these lands, and we didn't always have that freedom to do so. I mean, people were arrested outside of reservation boundaries as early as 1918. Um, and, and beyond until um, until the right was recognized in the early 80s. And so, wow. so that's why I think about um, during this time is the, just that freedom to be able to hunt, fish, and gather within that seated territory. Nice, thank you for that example. And I just wanna remind everyone that we are in the main group. So in another minute or two, we'll be joined by others. So I didn't want people to be alarmed or caught off guard. But what, I, what I've heard was, you know, some, some very unique takeaways that really the, the information is there, the content is there. And I would say that we've all been educated just in this discussion on some of historical perspectives, some of the why behind the work that the subcommittee will do. And not just the outcome, but the why, and then trying to marry that outcome with some economic development and some, some sense of belonging and some more connective tissue around Wisconsinites. So I really look forward to hearing and seeing what comes out of your subcommittee. I am actually buddied with Secretary Kolar as her peer support. So I will, I may be in a next subcommittee meeting that you all have, but she and I will debrief together and I will be Johnny on the spot to help out with your action plans. So know that she is not doing it alone. You are not doing it alone. I am here with you along with Larice and the others, but I am specifically set up to support you.
Um, so you may need another meeting before you get to that January meeting. So really think about what time you might carve out for this priority so that you do have uh, an action plan that is one that you're gonna wish to implement and you know will actually make a difference. So this is the important time. It ain't the sexy time because it's the hard work, but what, what the outcome will be will be the fruit of your labors and you will be able to be proud of what you produce and how uh, the state of Wisconsin will begin to implement and find some dollars to help implement. So I just wanted to, to share that with you all. Any questions that you all have of me or Deb in these final moments? Any questions about what we've captured or her notes? All right, well, we got a minute or so to stand up, stretch our legs, or I could sit down because I've been standing since 8.30 and talking with y'all. Uh, but we uh, will be joined by the rest of the uh, groups and I will close out the meeting um, here in the next moment or two. Thank you, Secretary Kremen. Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed hearing everyone's input today. So I will put out some dates uh, before the December holidays or early January, because I think we have more work to do to meet our goals of having our report for the February council meeting, uh, in addition to our 26th January meeting. So just stand by for seeing that on a calendar invite. Thank you. We actually have a little countdown going on. We have one minute before everybody will join us. And I, I'm just gonna take the time to say um, again, why I appreciate the conversation because uh, the concept of education and then also the qualitative and quantitative. And um, I remember, uh, a leader that I worked for and we were talking about recycling and I said it's the right thing to do you know but it's you know so you get this look and it's like you have to explain why it's the right thing to do and uh, Dr. White has pointed out a couple times including today that here's this event but here's why we do this event and we've talked about uh, Oktoberfest and do people know it is about the rich cultural heritage of Germans instead of just a reason to to over consume alcoholic beverages, so, um, and eat brats. But uh, again, so we've, we've talked about it quite a bit and I look forward to us getting it into a document that we can work with. And we do have uh, quantifiable achievements that we'll be able to measure. I guess it's a minute from when I close it. So they should be coming in in a minute. Okay, thank you. Mary, I'm just gonna take a moment to wish you a happy Veterans Day. Oh, thank you very much. It was, I'm exhausted. <laughs> it was an incredible whole week of, of events. So uh, thank you very much for that. I don't know if you saw it, but we had a absolutely wonderful event for, I uh, haven't done it in a couple of years at the Capitol yesterday. So it was just phenomenal. I, I, I did, it was wonderful. So that's why I was just like, but also for you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service and congratulations on your award. Thank you. I feel the same way, Secretary Collar. congratulations thank and thank you. <laughs> thank it's you. Important. It's important. Thank it is. I mean, it's important for us to say it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. You know, I, I'm glad you said that. It's made a point I made because you will hear veterans that say you don't need to thank me, but I, I truly believe that the audience, like, they appreciate hearing thank you. So you're welcome. Great. 
And I see we're being joined back in the main room by all of the other subcommittees. We were, uh, the uh, community engagement subcommittee was just taking a moment this morning to thank Secretary Mary Kolar for her service. Many of you know that she is in fact a veteran. And so I don't wanna uh, miss any other veterans that may be a part of the council. So to you all, uh, who are veterans and your families, thank you very much for your service. And so I wanna close out our council meeting this morning. We have covered a lot of ground. We have concluded our overall capacity building as part of these council meetings, and we have just embarked on creating our action plans. Hopefully the four questions utilized to guide the discussion on developing a guiding statement was helpful. I can truly say in our committee, the subcommittee community engagement, there was a robust conversation, a lot more learned, but we began to see the connective tissue in the values of what that subcommittee holds true as they move toward their guiding statement and the action plans. So I hope the other two committees had as fruitful conversation as we did. But what we also realized is when we look at these future meeting dates, our full council meeting date is gonna be February 11th. And it is in fact, if that meeting that we are going to articulate what those action plans are. And so if we're going to articulate what they are on February 11th, that means they have to be done and approved by that time. And so when you look at the subcommittee meeting dates that are coming up, we see economic and business development will be meeting uh, November 19th, so next week. But the other two subcommittee dates do have January dates on the books. So that's a lot of work that will be taking place off book, off subcommittee. So my sense is there likely will be other subcommittee uh, dates uh, trying to be polled for and utilized. And I wanna say the momentum that this council has is incredible. The governor is valuing the work that you're doing on this council and putting his money where his mouth is, ensuring that those federal dollars that have come to bear for this state is not just distributed in the old fashioned way, but distributed it in a way that is more equitable. And I will say a big part of that is because of you because of the work that you are doing in your respective jobs, in your community, and the information that you are imparting with this council in these quarterly meetings, they impact what he's doing and how he does his work. Therefore, you saw over a hundred million dollars distributed in a way that is to support all of us. And so our way of continuing to show our impact is by meeting and putting together these action plans so that he can move the work of this council forward and the state of Wisconsin can do better equitable work for its citizens. And so I thank you for the work that you've done in this council and the work that you're doing day to day, but know that the product that we deliver on February 11th is going to continue to move the needle and move this state forward when we think about the equity, diversity, and inclusion work. It's going to help people see themselves and express themselves and know that they will be supported in this work from this state government. So again, our future meeting as a council is February 11th. The subcommittee dates are listed. Please be open when your subcommittee lead reaches out to you to say, I think we might need another meeting so that you can continue to put the meat on the bones for your action plans. And again, you can get that work done however you need to, but please be open and receptive when you might get that email. And so with that, I will say, I am going to of course need a motion um, to adjourn. But before we do that, I wanna say 
does anybody have any burning questions that they have of me uh, or know that the notes will be sent to your subcommittee lead so that you'll have them so that when you have your next meeting, they will be ready and available to you. But any last questions, concerns that anyone has, this is your moment to ask that question. All right, know that I am always available via email, as is Larice, if questions do arise. Uh, being that it is mid-November, we are heading into the holiday season. I want to say happy Thanksgiving to everyone or whatever you choose to celebrate in this holiday season. Do be safe and be well. And I thank you all very much for your work. Do we have a motion to end the meeting? Motion to end the meeting. Marie Summers. Barnett second. Yep, Marie Summers and Victor Barnett has second. So with that, everyone have a good rest of your day. And thank you so much for all your good work. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Bye-bye.